Mars. Heating it up is easy. Transforming it is a whole other ball game. Have you ever thought that one day we might transform Mars into a place where we can live comfortably, breathing the air and strolling around in shorts and a t-shirt? Surely you have, since the future of space exploration is all about this idea. So much so that legions of nerds around the world are already packing their bags. Sure, it's the enthusiasm of youth, but the idea of reshaping the environment of Mars to make it cozy still seems like something out of a sci-fi book. Or maybe not. Some say that all it would take is warming up the atmosphere of Mars somehow and everything would fall into place. Just like in Total Recall, the movie that shows the red planet turning into an Eden with a blue sky. In this video, we might get a clearer idea of what can or cannot be done to make this extraordinary scientific dream come true. It's easy to understand why some might be skeptical about the future habitability of Mars. The fourth planet from the Sun isn't exactly the most hospitable place in the solar system. It's a cold, almost certainly sterile desert. However, according to some experts, Mars has everything needed to support life. Water, carbon, oxygen, and nitrogen. And that's not all. Its gravity, rotation speed, and axial tilt are almost a mirror image of Earth's making it a top candidate for a planetary makeover. But when did this crazy idea start circulating? The history of terraforming begins with the imagination of William Olaf Stapleton, an English writer who in 1930 gave us Last and First Men, a novel that takes us on a two billion year journey throughout space. In this story, humans transform Neptune into a green paradise by planting genetically modified vegetation that turns the toxic atmosphere into fresh air. Then in 1942, American Jack Williamson came along with his collision ship, where the word terraforming appeared for the first time. For a long time, this idea remained confined to science fiction novels until it started to gain traction in the scientific community. In 1961, Carl Sagan, the rising rock star of astronomy, proposed the idea of cooling Venus with some space algae even though the planet was and still is hotter than a barbecue in the middle of summer. Sagan's idea was to seed the upper atmosphere of Venus with blue-green algae spores, essentially cyanobacteria known for surviving immersion in liquid nitrogen in hot springs with waters exceeding 80 degrees Celsius. This incredible resilience would make them ideal candidates for surviving the extreme conditions of the cloud-covered planet. But that's not all. These algae are also known for their remarkable ability to break down carbon dioxide into oxygen and carbon, thus countering the greenhouse effect while enabling the photosynthesis of other green plants. However attractive this scenario might be, it wouldn't have had much of a chance of radically transforming the climate of Venus, as Sagan wrote the article before the prohibitive atmospheric pressure was known, which he estimated had only four bars. With such pressure, not even a super-powered algae could change things. But Sagan's bold idea, though unproductive, had the effect of a small tsunami, and the concept of terraforming began to gain traction everywhere, despite the term still being viewed with skepticism by more conservative scientists. It wasn't just science fiction authors and visionaries like Sagan discussing it anymore. And after the mid-1960s, thanks to the first interplanetary probes, we got a look at our rocky neighbors, and it turned out that Mars deserved the title of most Earth-like, making it the ideal candidate for a potential environmental makeover. However, Mars today is still a planet decidedly hostile to life. It's very cold, minus 53 degrees Celsius on average, with fluctuations between minus 140 degrees Celsius and plus 20 degrees Celsius. Its atmospheric pressure is very low, 1 one sixtieth of Earth's. Liquid water is never found on the surface except under very specific conditions. And its atmosphere is unbreathable for humans, 96% CO2. Additionally, the surface is consistently bombarded by cosmic and ultraviolet rays, radiation that makes the establishment of life almost impossible. So why is Mars considered the most suitable planet for the first terraforming? 
The main reason is that, according to what we know today, the red planet is the only object in the solar system, besides Earth of course, where liquid water once flowed. It's also likely that it even had a large ocean in the northern hemisphere. A dense atmosphere composed mainly of carbon dioxide and significant amounts of fresh water in lakes and rivers. These conditions are believed to have existed in the first billion years of the solar system. Subsequently, for reasons still partially unknown, there was a gradual absorption of the atmosphere into the soil and a partial dispersion into space. The atmosphere became so thin that the planet entered a self-reinforcing cooling phase. At this point, the solution seems to suggest itself. According to some, to bring Mars back to life, all we need to do is return it to its youth. Scientists agree that the first level of terraforming will be achieved when 1. The atmospheric mass is increased enough to significantly reduce the amount of radiation reaching the surface, 2. Liquid water is available on the surface, and 3. The ground temperature is raised by about 60 degrees Celsius. Essentially, when the conditions on Mars resemble those of Earth in the pre-Cambrian period, a complete and autonomous biosphere capable of supporting anaerobic microorganisms. To reach this scenario, the first step will be to increase the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere to leverage the greenhouse effect. This will gradually raise the temperature and trigger a chain reaction. But where can we find the necessary CO2? Before going on, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe to our channel by clicking the bell. This will encourage us to do better and you'll never miss any of our weekly videos. The Martian ice caps might be the most accessible solution. It's estimated that they contain enough CO2 to raise the atmospheric pressure from 6 m bar, thousandths of a bar, to 100 m bar. And the regolith, especially at higher latitudes, could push this pressure up to 400 to 500 m bar. But how reliable are these numbers? These optimistic estimates don't account for a harsh reality. We don't know exactly how much CO2 is on Mars. This is one of the Achilles heels of terraforming. If we've lost too much atmosphere to space, recreating it will be a daunting task. If, however, it has been absorbed by the regolith or trapped in the ice caps, then the process might be more feasible. If the estimates are wrong and Mars doesn't have enough CO2, the situation becomes more complicated. In 2004, Mars Express revealed that the southern polar cap is mostly water ice, with only a 10-meter thick surface layer of CO2. If true, the total sublimation of this layer would increase the pressure by just 0.36 m bar. But perhaps the CO2 is hidden elsewhere, found in carbonates like on Earth. Here carbonates release CO2 through volcanic activity. On Mars, we would have to release it using extreme methods such as nuclear explosions or asteroid impacts with significant environmental consequences. However, there are also positive signs. In a Martian year, atmospheric pressure can rise by 20% with the sublimation of CO2 from the ice caps in spring. What if we could trigger a similar process? Starting with the melting of the southern polar cap, CO2 would be released increasing pressure and the greenhouse effect. This heat would then melt more ice, releasing even more gas and amplifying the greenhouse effect. According to calculations, an increase of just 4 degrees Celsius in the southern polar cap would start this chain reaction. But even if this is true, how do we practically trigger the chain reaction? It's important to note that the technologies discussed are not yet ready but some believe they could be by the end of the century. We're not abandoning the scientific method for fantasy, but rather exploring the immediate future of an evolving science. It's no surprise then that bold proposals like that of English astronomer Paul Birch have emerged. He suggested building a giant mirror with a radius of 125 kilometers to reflect sunlight back onto the south pole of Mars. The goal? To increase the temperature by at least 4 degrees Celsius, enough to release the carbon dioxide trapped as dry ice. This mirror, positioned in a fixed spot above the pole, would need to be made of mylar and aluminum, with a total weight of 200,000 tons. Constructing such an object on Earth is unthinkable, so we'll have to wait until we can extract and produce materials in space, perhaps on the Moon. 
And with the new race to the moon heating up, we might not have to wait too long. But carbon dioxide isn't the only greenhouse gas, nor the most powerful. Chlorofluorocarbons CFCs, banned in the 1980s for their role in damaging the ozone layer, are much more effective. With CFCs, we could trigger the greenhouse effect on Mars in just 20 years, though at a prohibitive cost, requiring the construction of CFC factories on the planet itself. This industrial effort would be enormous and likely require hundreds of workers, making it unlikely that such a project could be realized before the mid-22nd century. Another way to increase the temperature of the polar cap would be to sprinkle it with a black powdery substance, like coal dust. This would reduce the amount of sunlight reflected by the caps into space, resulting in the ice warming up. According to a NASA study, this method could vaporize the caps entirely in a couple of centuries. But where to find this black powder? Some suggest bringing it from Phobos and Deimos, which are among the darkest bodies in the solar system, or introducing dark extremophilic microbial life forms like lichens, algae, and bacteria. However, Mars is already the second darkest planet in the solar system, absorbing over 70% of incoming sunlight, so there's little room to darken it further. And digging up thousands of tons of dark regolith on Phobos to spread it over the ice that's no small feat either. Not to mention even crazier proposals like triggering nuclear reactions inside Phobos to turn it into a small star, or detonating nuclear bombs in the craters of ancient volcanoes to reactivate them, or altering the orbits of some asteroids to crash them into the polar caps. Speaking of bizarre and dangerous ideas, Elon Musk recently proposed bombing the poles of Mars with hundreds of atomic bombs to release all the CO2 contained there. Fortunately, NASA promptly rejected this proposal, demonstrating beyond the ethical issue that it would take thousands of explosions a day to achieve any significant result. So, the ideas to wake up the planet by raising its temperature are there, but the fact remains that these projects are all currently far beyond our technological capabilities and will likely remain so for many centuries. Terraforming a planet like Mars also requires knowledge in climatology and planetology that we are far from having. Today, humans are unable to control Earth's climate, and we must admit that we suffer from it much more than we control it. But there's more. The Red Planet is also plagued by two major handicaps that could ruin any terraforming effort. Mars is a small planet with only a tenth of Earth's mass, and its gravitational field has proven incapable of preventing a significant portion of its precious atmosphere from escaping into space. Even if we manage to form a atmosphere, the problem will be keeping it. Unlike Earth, Mars no longer has a global magnetic field. The dynamo effect ceased with the rapid cooling of its metallic core, which is also related to the planet's small size. On Earth, this magnetic field forms a shield that protects the atmosphere from the abrasive effects of the solar wind. Despite their genius, pessimists say humans will never be able to reactivate the magnetic field of Mars, although recently the idea of placing a dipolar magnet shield at the Lagrange point L1 of Mars to create an artificial magnetosphere around the planet has been proposed and the planet will never again be able to rely on this formidable natural umbrella to prevent the erosion of its atmosphere. If a solution to this problem cannot be found, given the absence of a global magnetic field and the weakness of gravity, humans will probably have to abandon any dream of terraforming forever. A very harsh verdict indeed, but for the sake of discussion, let's assume we somehow manage to trigger the greenhouse effect on Mars increasing atmospheric pressure to at least a tenth of Earth's and allowing water to form pools here and there. What should be the next step? Well, at that point, if we ever get there, the plan is to rely, just as Sagan recommended for Venus, on the cavalry, that is, bacteria. Microorganisms seem to be the ideal actors for the terraforming of the red planet. Just like on Earth, they could release ammonia or methane, Gas is much more efficient in terms of the greenhouse effect than carbon dioxide. Laboratory simulations have already shown that some species of methanogenic bacteria can cope with reduced atmospheric pressure and find the nutrients necessary for their survival in the Martian soil. 
They can also survive radiation doses 3,000 times higher than those that would kill a human. If 1% of the planet is covered with bacteria that have an efficiency of 0.1% in converting solar energy into a chemical compound, every year 1 billion tons of methane and ammonia would be produced, increasing the temperature by 10 degrees Celsius every 30 years. Additionally, the methane and ammonia produced by their metabolism would provide good protection against UV rays. Once this phase is reached, the benefits for future colonists will already be significant. The next step towards complete terraforming will involve the radical transformation of the atmosphere by introducing oxygen and nitrogen and eliminating carbon dioxide. This is essentially the well-known process of photosynthesis, through which Earth's plants provide oxygen to the animal world. To increase the oxygen content of the atmosphere of Mars, we can spread cyanobacteria on the Martian surface, which are accustomed to living in extreme conditions, like in Antarctica. Cyanobacteria are among the first living beings on our planet. For two billion years, these organisms reigned supreme on Earth's surface and profoundly changed the composition of the atmosphere. By capturing CO2 and releasing oxygen through their photosynthetic activity, they could gradually change the composition of the atmosphere of Mars as well. Why not? Let's imagine we managed to bring the partial pressure of oxygen to 1 M bar. At that point, genetically adapted higher plants could grow freely on Mars, producing even more oxygen until it exceeds 120 M bar. This would make the air sufficiently oxygenated to allow the first Martians to go outside without respirators. With this approach, in a few decades, Mars could transition from a dry, frozen planet to a warm, humid one capable of supporting life. Humans wouldn't need spacesuits, just simple respirators. Inflatable domes could create habitats and simple plants could thrive and spread, enriching the atmosphere with oxygen and allowing the growth of more complex plants and animals. Ordinary terrestrial lichens have already shown they can survive in conditions similar to those on Mars, suggesting that microorganisms and simple plants could be the key to less invasive terraforming. Of course, all this wouldn't happen in a day or even a year. It would probably take centuries of continuous experimentation, and there's no guarantee we'll have all that time. And then perhaps you haven't thought about it, but the low temperature of Mars might not be such a tragic problem to endure. Let's be clear, there's no doubt that Mars is very cold. The average temperature across the planet is about minus 63 degrees Celsius, compared to Earth's more hospitable 14 degrees Celsius. Even in the Martian tropics, nighttime temperatures can drop to nearly minus 90 degrees Celsius. However, temperature readings on Mars can be highly misleading for us Earthlings. This is because people generally base their notions of comfort in cold and windy conditions on their personal experiences, all of which occur within our planet's much thicker atmosphere. As mentioned earlier, the atmospheric pressure on the surface of Mars is less than 1% of that at sea level on Earth. This is roughly the same pressure as Earth's atmosphere at an altitude of 32 kilometers, about 2.5 times the cruising altitude of commercial airliners. Such thin air isn't very effective at carrying away heat, even when winds blow at 100 kilometers per hour, as sometimes happens during global dust storms on the Red Planet. In other words, on Mars, the wind chill effect, where air sweeps away heat from a body warmer than its surroundings, is almost non existent. To illustrate this, someone came up with the idea of converting Martian temperatures into something more understandable. This new parameter, the Earth equivalent temperature, is the air temperature on Earth, in the shade and still air, that provides the same heat loss and surface temperature as the cold but insubstantial winds on Mars. The results of these conversions are surprising. According to estimates, the global average temperature of Mars of minus 16 degrees Celsius without wind is only 1 degree Celsius colder than the average winter wind chill temperature in Minneapolis, Minnesota. In short, on Mars, the temperature felt by the human body would be bearable even with very light and tight-fitting suits. Of course, with the hassle of having to use a respirator constantly. So, are we sure it's really necessary to terraform Mars? The beauty and scientific interest of the planet could be valid reasons to preserve it as it is. 
Certainly exploring and colonizing new worlds could be a form of life insurance for our species. However, Carl Sagan warned that terraforming should not be a solution to overpopulation or resource seeking. Even in that case, as demonstrated in another one of our videos, the numbers wouldn't be in our favor. The question remains, should we change the face of Mars? The most spontaneous answer is this, let's get there first, then we'll decide.